Okay, can I welcome everyone to this, the fourth meeting of the Public Commission's Com Petitions Committee in 2019. The first petition is Petition 1600, lodged by John Chapman in February 2016 on speed awareness courses. At our most recent consideration of this petition in September 2018, we recognised and acknowledged the petitioner's frustration with the time being taken to have a sense of any progress being made in this issue, and we agreed it would be helpful to take oral evidence from the Transport Minister or its officials and Police Scotland. In advance of agreeing a date for that evidence session, we have received an update from the Crown Office and Property Creator Fiscal Service. That update is included in our meeting papers and confirms that the Lord Advocate has agreed in principle to the use of speed awareness courses as an alternative to prosecution in appropriate cases. It adds that a multi-agency working group will work together to devise the necessary infrastructure and guidance to support the introduction of speed awareness courses. Members may be aware that this development has been widely reported in the media this week. The petitioner welcomes the update but wants to understand whether the multi-agency working group will be working to an agreed time scale. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? I think it's uh, very welcome that, uh, that, that this has been considered. And uh, I, I think uh, Mr Chapman will be very pleased um, that the Lord Advocate has agreed in principle. Um, and in which case that multi-agency group uh, which includes quite a number of um, bodies, um, might want to come and provide evidence to this committee. Yeah, I would agree uh, with Rachel Hamilton. The, the, um, it would certainly be good to know um, a, what timescale the multi-agency working group is, is going to take. Uh, and then it's, <coughs> I can understand the petitioner's uh, frustration at the length of time uh, that this is taken, and if the multi-agency working group is going to take, um, you know, even longer, then uh, you know it's certainly unfortunate to say the least. So we need to get an answer on that specific question, uh, and the best way to do that is to to get them uh, in front of us here at committee. Okay. Any other comments? I mean, it did strike me that something that's about speed awareness moves exceptionally <laughs> slowly, um, and I think if I recall from our last discussion, this was just. How difficult is it? And if it's so difficult to do something as small as this, you do rather wonder about other bits of policy that you know we might be involved in. You just wonder what the normal time scales with these kind of things would be. So I think with <coughs> Angus' suggestion and Rachel's suggestion, we have the um, the group in front of us, and we can have that kind of conversation. I think it would lend a bit of understanding. Um, what are the complexities of this? It takes something which seems like the Lord Advocates agreed to it. How long can it possibly be before it can be implemented? But I think um, I think we've all agreed that the, we recognise the, the merits of the petition, and it would be worthwhile trying to establish um, a timescale. And I think again, the petition makes a point: an end point, not just it will roughly take X amount of time, but can they identify a time that they will then work back from? I think would be useful. Yeah, um, I'll also convene, and I think I mean. Uh, Previously, they've they've had uh, courses for drunk drivers and and uh, other, uh, other other issues. So you know, I, I don't think it's exactly uh, reinventing the wheel to to get this up and running. So you know, the sooner the better, basically. Okay, before we run out of puns, it's probably a good <laughs> idea. Okay, so we're agreeing to invite representatives of the multi-agency working group to provide oral evidence in advance of the summer recess and. I think one of the things we would be looking for would be some kind of sense of um, time scale um, in, in that regard. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, the next petition is Petition 1687, lodged by Jane Erskine in March 2018, on the regulation of firework displays in Scotland. The petition is set particularly in the context of rural locations and from an animal welfare perspective. We last considered this petition in October 2018. In response to correspondence issued following that meeting, the Scottish Government advised that it was due to launch a consultation on the use and regulation of fireworks early this year. The Clark's note confirms that the consultation was launched on the 3rd of February and closes on the 13th of May. It, no it notes also that the consultation includes a section on animal welfare and asks for examples of local practice. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. David. Convener, I think we should defer the petition until the results come in from the consultation that's published by the Scottish Government, then we'll have a better idea of where the petition is going. Okay. 
Any other options? Well, I mean, I think it's a great uh, a petition, but uh, I think the Scottish Government are already looking at it. And I, I'm not sure if I agree with David, but perhaps we are in the position to close the petition. So it's weighing up the, the benefits of whether the Scottish Government will take this consultation um, forward as Jane Erskine would um, be happy with. So I think we probably have two options. We can either defer the, or, you know, hold on to the petition, but recognise there's going to be a consultation and look at responses to that. Or we can ask, encourage the petitioner to engage with the consultation and recognise that if at the end of that process the Scottish Government doesn't you know, respond in the way that she would hope and expect, particularly around the experience of animals and welfare issue in, in rural areas, of course she would be free then to submit a further petition, maybe focusing very specifically on that question, so she could then focus on the bit the Scottish Government has failed to address. I mean, there is a much broader question about fireworks, and not just in rural areas, but in, in urban areas too. But yeah, um, um, so I think that's the choice we have. We've clearly had both of these options identified already. I don't know whether Brian or Angus have a view. See, uh, uh, can you know, uh, that uh, I think it's uh, the, the, the petition um, has had a, a positive effect in that we've. we've now we've got the Scottish Government um, looking into this particular uh, particular issue. I think the, her petition um, is, a, is quite broad. Um, my feeling is that um, it's probably achieved what it, it, it was going to achieve uh, at the outset, and that uh, um, it gives her the opportunity to come back at a future a future date, should the outcome of that uh, the government. Uh, Investigation not be to her, to her satisfaction. Um, with a, as you say, a much more targeted one. I, my feeling would be at this point we, we could uh, we, we could actually close this petition just now um, with the, okay. with a view, of, you know, for, potentially for another one coming down the line. And Casnell, bring David back in after. Um, okay. Well, we haven't heard that yet. Because more bother. No, for, for a change. Um, the uh, I actually agree with Rachel Hamilton and uh, uh, Brian. The um, I, I think we have an opportunity to close the petition, um, given that the petitioner can come back in future if there is still uh, an issue that the government hasn't addressed, uh, and given that uh, the petitioner has a year. It has to wait a year. I mean, it could well be, as we've seen in the past with consultations, that the government could take an inordinate length of time to uh, re release the the results and and take further action. Um, so, you know, we'll just obviously have to wait and see. But uh, in the meantime, close the petition, uh, but advise the petitioner that she can always come back. To okay. The committee. Well, Okay, so I, I, I think there's a recognition that whatever way we were going to do it, we recognise the importance of the petition, we recognise that it has secured some movement. We would hope the petitioner, as I said, um, would both engage with the consultation herself and may encourage other people, even through um, um, this being um, publicised, to engage with that. And I would hope the Scottish Government, as a consequence of the interest in it, would ensure that the consultation didn't just drift, but that actually recognised was something quite important here. But there is an opportunity for the petitioner if she feels that, that consultation doesn't lead to the action that she's looking for to come back to the committee on that um, basis. So we agreed that we we close the petition, um, recognise what has, has been achieved with it, and um, we'd want to thank the petitioner very much for um, both presenting the petition and engaging with the committee in relation to it. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for that. If we can now move on to agenda item two, the consideration of continued petitions. So um, the second item on the agenda is the inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland. As you know, this inquiry was launched in connection with petition 1627, consent for mental health treatment for people under 18 years of age, raised by Annette McKenzie. A call for evidence was issued on the 7th of November 2018 and ran until 14th of December 2018. In response to this, the committee received 49 written responses and using the digital consultation tool Dialogue, received views from 72 contributors as well as many more comment commenters. In addition to these responses, two outreach events were held in Edinburgh at Muirhouse Millennium Centre and Tynecastle High School. 
Can I suggest that we use the paper to provide the basis of our discussion and the feedback we have received so far? And in addition to this, members of the committee have received hard copies of um, all the written submissions for their consideration, and, and they were very substantial. I want to thank everyone who did contribute in whatever um, way that they did, whether it was through dialogue or through individual response or through some of these very substantial written comments that we got. Um, I wonder if members have any comments on the themes highlighted in the paper or any observations from the written submissions. Brian? Um, thank you, Kavina. I think, you know, I think we all recognise you know, the, the, the evidence we took from Annette McKenzie, you know, was, was brave, but it, it was, you know, it, it, was, it was quite hard to hear, to be quite honest, and, and it's, um, and it's been under consideration with this for this committee uh, since then. Probably one of the, the ones that's affected us. I think I can speak for all of us. Affected us the most. And I think that um, there's a bigger piece of work to be done here. Um, I, I think this discussion is quite timely um, because in the Health and Sport Committee on Tuesday there was another mental health uh, petition that was. Uh, closed on, 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 and during that discussion, um, I did uh, say that this committee um, had uh, received several uh, petitions around uh, around mental health, um, and and that there is a bigger work to do. I think there's almost across committee work here. Think, obviously, health and sport, we've we've got it here. I think education. Is sitting with that, even the even the rural economy, it, it, talking about you know the, the mental health of of, um, of farmers, etc. There's, there's there's a I, I just get the sense here there's a much bigger piece of work could be done at the moment. It's it's been done across different committees. It's been doing, been done across different cross party groups. Um, you know, I think we need, to, we need we if if we really want to tackle this. Um, and it's been talk, talked a lot about in this parliament. I think we actually start to need to pull resource together, and I don't know how we do that, uh, convener, because there's a few things that come out come out for me. Um, uh, one, um, where young people can go, um, or can feel comfortable to go uh, when when they're, they're, they're falling into poor mental health. What Annette McKenzie raised for me was. Uh, and I, I've said this before, is, is uncomfortable with this idea of presenting, young people presenting with mental health issues, their capability then to self-administer self you know, uh, uh, you know, medication, um, and all the, all the connotations and, and, and different uh, uh, things that come out around that. So for me, there's a big piece of work to be done here. Um, as I said, I don't know. I don't have you. You sit in the education uh, committee as well. I, mean, I don't know what, what what the feeling is there. And you sit in the the clear committee as well. Is that right? I, I don't know what what the, what the sense of feeling is is across those committees as well. But health and sport were looking to us, and what we are going to do today, um, to see where they go with it. And I just feel everybody's just we're, we're, we're at the sort of a gate of perhaps doing something really positive. About this particular issue, and, and and I think we're at a time where we, we we should look at a way to grasp that. And I don't know how we, you know, I'm looking at you, convener, because I don't know how we do that across all those all, all those committees. But it seems to me that this is something that that, that is is a growing issue that we need to we, we need to grasp the nettle here. I think some of it is just simply about understanding it, and I think what has come out of inquiry thus far is this question of you know what's the first point of contact and in that first point of contact is the person you're speaking to aware that there are options other than just going to the doctor yep. so you know any one of us who might be in circumstances where somebody would say I'm not I don't know what to do I need a bit of help just genuinely I think the idea that you would that thing about mental first aid training mental health first aid training that people would know perhaps to be empathetic or to, to make those kind of suggestions. And I think there's quite interesting commentary in our submissions around who's trusted and how young people might, what we might think might be a reasonable suggestion, or just go and ask your teacher when actually that is not the person you've got the right relationship with in the school, it may be somebody else or, or whatever. Um, I think that's a question. I think the other thing that comes out quite clearly and is something we'd want to explore further 
that the professionals that young people might come up against are themselves dealing with quite significant pressures in their own time. So a GP's only got 10 minutes. What kind of assessment can you make in 10 minutes? Um, how do you support GPs who are only got 10 minutes to understand? And you, know, I think some information in here too I've had before about how GPs themselves could be supported. Equally, the pressure on teachers, you know, where, where is, how do they ensure that somebody is directed in the, in, in the right way? So I think there are quite interesting, again, from our evidence, maybe some of the things that we think are quite straightforward pathways aren't as straightforward if you're a young person. I think there's one mother talks about just the challenges of this for her own kids in terms of, it's not just simply, we'll get you a referral and you will go. It's actually, um, even if you get a referral, you feel the appointment. I mean, I, when I was still teaching, there were young people, even if you got them, there was an educational psychologist or a group worker was going to work with them, they'd quite often find ways of just not going because you hadn't built the confidence that it was something that they, that they could get something from. So there's all sorts of trust issues, I think, in there as well. Rachel? Um, I like the um, idea of doing this in a thematic approach because I feel that uh, it, it is quite. It was quite a difficult paper to get through um, with, you know, 49 um, submissions of evidence, which was fantastic. There were themes running through it, um, from education to the referral process to whether CAMS was suitable for uh, only suitable for adults and not for young people. I mean, I actually, I actually found um, the evidence really fascinating and. Although there are themes running through it, a lot of people gave different ideas. And I mean, some of the things that um, I've highlighted, and I'm sorry if it looks like a scattergun approach, but I'm hoping that the clerks can bring this together in this thematic approach. Um, so a number of the, um, a number of, um, of the evidence uh, based submissions uh, actually said that should young, children and young people's mental health be treated differently. Um, and I liked uh, the idea of uh, creating a task force that involved young people, in particular the evidence that was given from um, Young Edinburgh Action um, was very focused and they'd used a focused approach and so had um, the, Institu uh, the Institute for um, Mental Health. Uh, they they had um, actually looked at a workshop. Um, this is based at the University of um, Birmingham with eight students to explore those pathways. And I thought that the submissions from the Girl Guides as well was really powerful because it was involving young people and, and children. And actually, I think sometimes adults have a preconceived idea about how um, the referral or the pathways are. And including GPs, when I've spoken to GPs, they, oh, they say things like, you know, um, the perception is that CAMS is the right way to go, but actually sometimes it isn't. Um, so there are, there are many suggestions. Um, another aspect that I think is really important is uh, the, the budgets. Do they belong to the NHS or the council? Um, and where is it best to place a service? And it's different across Scotland throughout the evidence. Um, I, I also noticed that... Um, one one evidence had, had given that the are the services provided equitable? Um, are they based on uh, are they based on SI, SIMD um, indices? And also looked at the referral pathways of engagement with support for all mental health services for young people in relation to that. So I'm already I think I'm already sounding as if I'm sort of mixing too many things together here. So um, I wondered whether we could look at all comments sort of on the education process, the, the stakeholders that are involved, the pathways, and sort of go through it in that, in that way, if it's possible. I think the, we don't want to be overwhelmed by, it's just massive, and because it's so massive, we can't do anything, so we want to kind of yeah. bear down, I think, on, on particular issues, but I think all of the things that you've highlighted are really important. One of the things you talk about, um, some of the youth organisations that have commented, one of the things that struck me too was the number of young people who are offering support to friends, which is like, just makes perfect sense. And not to over-medicalise something, so, well, I can't help you as a friend because this is 
a mental health issue when in fact that is what you need. You need a bit of reassurance, a bit of support, a bit of this is we're all going through this together. And so I think I'm quite interested in having that, looking at that where we don't turn it into it is a thing that professionals deal with for you because you've got this thing when in fact there is there's some of this is round about life experience and what's happening to you. And I think youth organisations um, are very good at if they're working with young people they will know. Sometimes when young people are under pressure in their in their lives, whether it's exams or family circumstances or whatever, and we'll know how to offer that kind of support and it's how we draw on on that a bit so that um professional services are not overly you know, they end up loads of people going there when that's not really what they require, but that if they do need to go there and they do need that route to the um you know, I suppose through CAMS or whatever that they are able to access that as well. And I think the question around budgeting is actually very important in this regard because if you've got a budget in your school for the mental well being of your students, does that all get spent on a counsellor or actually are there broader supports that could also be funded before? So in order that when a person needed a counsellor they would know how to get to that place? Just a, a quick um, input. Um, some people had said that in local authorities, the Attainment Challenge Fund and the Pupil Equity Funding was being used um, at, at those levels. And I think that is also different throughout Scotland. So how that money is being used and is that money sustainable? Will that money always be able to fund what is currently being funded? Well, there's a whole question about how I think the whole point of that money is that it can be used very flexibly. Um, the problem, may, you, could, you might argue there's an issue about sustainability because it's not um, long term. And that while one school may see that need, other schools may be blind to those needs and so it's going to be quite interesting how make those, people make those kind of um, decisions. I suppose at the heart of this, so we, going back to the petition, is to think about a young person who feels they need help how do we get, do they know where to go? How do we make sure young people know where to go? How do we make sure that when they go for that help, that help is appropriate to actually how they're feeling and the people around about them are well enough informed to be able to, to support them. But at the same time, if somebody's going into a crisis or whatever, that is also recognised. So, Angus? Yeah, <coughs> I think you make some uh, valid points, Karina, with regard to peer-to-peer uh, -peer support and um, the, the first point of contact. Um, from evidence that we've had in the past at this committee, um, clearly, uh, I think from Sam H, peer-to-peer um, -peer support um, it should certainly be encouraged, so, so that's something that uh, we, we definitely need to look at. But with regard to uh, Brian Whittle's call for a, a, a larger piece of work, um, you know, I think we need I think we need to know how we've got here and what's the cause of the the, the, the large increase in, in mental health cases. Um, I recently read a piece in the New Statesman um, which highlighted uh, or looked at the rise in mental health in, in Nordic countries. Uh, and there was a direct correlation between the increased use of smartphones with the increase in, in mental health issues in, in young people. So. Um, you know, but Brian would have certainly got a point that there needs to be, you know, more work on on how we've got to this situation. But unfortunately, you know, we don't have that in the remit of this inquiry, um, and we can all we can do is, is deal with how to how to address the issues and 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 where where they can get that help. Um, but yeah, I, I fully agree that there should be a, a wider piece of work somewhere in this parliament mm. uh, looking at the causal effect as well as how we deal with it. Would it be worthwhile to ask the clerks to bring forward something round what the themes are and how we're going to investigate these further? But in any report we produce, that one of the recommendations might be about we actually have to look at this broader context and somebody, some, you know, like the Scottish Government itself, um, could be considering doing that kind of work. I mean, we are going to have the, the Minister for Mental Health in front of us at some point. It would be quite interesting to have that kind of, of conversation, I think. My sense is that, that we have both the challenge of the big picture, 
but also the very practical issues to make sure that young people are more informed about how they're feeling and what that means and how they can get help. And you know, um, and when they do get help, it's the appropriate help and it's it's supported and people are comfortable, not so much about breaking confidentiality, but ensuring that uh, the young person understands that for other people to know it's not a problem. It shouldn't be something that they're, they're resisting. It's something that's actually going to support them. I, mean, I go back to the conversation we had when Maureen Watt was here as the minister and saying to her, you know, if somebody had a diagnosis of cancer, your first instinct would be to make sure to encourage them to let the family know and to get all the family support round about them. But somehow this is seen differently in terms of your mental health, which I just don't... I get that somebody might want to have, have um, confidentiality and that should be respected, but we ought not to treat it in a different way because any condition that you've got is, I think, um, you're going to be better supported if you've got folk round about you that are looking out for you. Hi. Brian? It's just, it's just on on that theme, and, and also following on from from uh, what Rachel Hamilton was saying, we we did, did some stuff it was around the suicide strategy in the um, health and support committee, and, and we did a, a, we went out to uh, to interview uh, um, a, a number of people, and my, I myself and, and Sandra White went to Cardinal College, and ended up we sat around a table with about a dozen students, all of whom had attempted suicide at some point or other. So uh, they were you know, obviously quite far down that spectrum. And some of the things that came out of that, they actually knew what could help. They knew what could help. They knew if, if, they, if they got themselves out and, 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 and ate better. They knew if they were out and, and joined a club and be physically active, it would help their condition. They knew if they, they sought out medical help, that would help as well. And they did none of it. The, 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 their condition was such that they just didn't do didn't do any of it, and the one thing was you know it, it was quite harrowing to to, to listen to to, to th that as you, you might imagine. But one thing that came out of it was they came up with a solution themselves. It's the first time they'd all sat around the table together. First, they didn't know each other, mm -hmm. but, but, the, 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 but that collective understanding was just that peer to peer support. They actually came up with a solution themselves, and it was at Cardinal College themselves then enabled that solution to take part. And I've actually got it in my head to go back there and find out how that's how that is actually doing. But this idea of you know allowing the the the, the, uh, the youngsters themselves to to be part of the, the solution and find out part of that solution, take ownership, mm -hmm. I think, is is a, is a huge uh, is a huge way forward. And and, and as I said, I, th I think this that 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 kind of, kind of evidence there. Is, is sitting within this parliament, and that's why I'm going to say pulling that all that together into the into one more cohesive uh, uh, document. I think is is, is something that uh, I think could be really beneficial. Okay, I mean, in terms of, of themes, th there's certainly an issue around um, from the submission around training, so that people know how to respond you know, across um, the system where young pe where people are coming across young people. The whole question of awareness raising, I, mean, I don't recall really ever having a conversation um, with the, the school that my kids went to about my awareness or you know who would I refer them to, and that's just a general thing. Um, I remember way back in the day when I was still teaching, the sense that the guidance staff had a responsibility and you could def you know refer parents to them and so on. I suppose how do you make that kind of consistent? So that awareness raising for family and carers and others to know how to respond. And is there an issue too about early intervention and prevention? This is something that uh, is flagged up in a, um, the submissions and certainly the Scottish Children's Services Coalition. In their submission, say, a national programme of mental health training for all staff in schools in Scotland is vital, delivering a whole school approach to mental well-being. Parents should also be able to easily access information to provide them with a greater understanding of mental health problems. Children and young people should also be made more aware of the mental health set advice, information and support available to them, including the provision of an appropriately experienced counsellor in all secondary schools. And that seems to me to be what's needed. It, we have to think about how then people access that and understand yes. their, own, their, their own circumstances. Um, and... Um, the other thing that I think was flagged up um, was the question that there are, there's an issue about the particular experience 
of mental health issues for um, some young people, perhaps those within the LGBT community, those with um, yeah. disabilities, you know, who maybe are coming up against all sorts of other things in their lives that they may need support with. Rachel? Uh, one of the submissions actually stated that uh, the counselling model in, models in school um, might not reach the most vulnerable and whether that was appropriate and the, uh, the training needed to be not only for teachers but for GPs and the voluntary sector as well. Um, and one of the submissions also said that um, a number of uh, training programmes had been developed um, that were consistent. Yeah, I mean, I think your thing about hard to reach young people, young people who are already disengaged from the system, and they're disengaged from the system because of what's happening around about them, and they're maybe stressed or whatever, are the very ones who are not, because they've fallen out of the system or they don't trust it, how do we reach out to these young people? And it's, you know, some of that is about school systems reaching out into families and supporting them as well, I think. But... That's a whole big other question that, that the Education Committee is wrestling with, which is around what are the supports within a school that are not teaching and how fundamental that support staff is around additional support needs and um, support teachers to do their job and, and their learning environment. So I think we're agreed. We've, we certainly know and we recognise, and I think Brian makes the point at, at the beginning of this conversation very importantly, that we have all been struck by and were affected by an Aunt McKenzie's petition. And we have in our minds that the purpose of this um, inquiry is to ensure that a young person who's looking for help gets the help that's appropriate and the people round about them know how to respond. Um, and that there's a conversation around mental health, which is about everyone knowing how to respond, knowing how to support somebody, um, and ensuring that this is not something that you have to keep to yourself, but it's something that um, we all need to discuss more. And there's been loads and loads of references to what's in, in here. And Brian's bigger point about across the system, how this important is, and Angus's point, what are the causes of it, I think could be reflected in a report. Um, but I think what we do want from the clerks is probably something that gets us to look at some of these themes um, in conjunction with some of the people who have perhaps given submissions, um, perhaps some people with, um, you, you, we talked earlier about peer-to-peer -peer support and girl guides and so on, who have kind of worked through all of this, getting that sense of what that would look like. So we, we know, sadly, from the petition, what it looks like when a system fails. What does a system that doesn't fail look like and what can we do to maybe make recommendations around that? Um, if that makes sense, I think you know that the big issue. I don't want what we're trying to do to be overwhelmed by. Mm -hmm. It's all so massive, but we would want what we do to be contributing to that bigger picture. Um, and then I think at the end of it, Brian, we can maybe think then: Is this something along with the other committees we want to have a further conversation about? One of the things that frustrates me, has frustrated me ever since coming here around mental health, we all, we all understand, as you alluded to, the, the, the stigma that surrounds having poor mental health, um, as opposed to I have a, a, you know, a, a, a cancer diagnosis. You know. And the, at the end of the day, we talk about mental health and parity with mental health with physical. Do you know what? It's just health. Mm -hmm. It's just all health, and I think what we what from rather than talk about parity, it's it's how mental health becomes just part of health, and and, and as discussed, the same as any other health. And I think how we break down that stigma in there is, is I think is is a, is a major part uh, of of the work we should be doing in this parliament. Well, I certainly think that the move to talk about your mental health as part of well-being makes sense mm -hmm. that actually you know to keep yourself um mentally healthy the things that you can do in the same way as you can keep yourself physically healthy um i think has been an, an, an important development david you want to say something it was a very successful campaign around the stigma of mental health the see me campaign um was very and i know um, within my area it was very very successful in the past so, so maybe we could look at things like that and how successful they were and removing the stigma around mental health i think sometimes that's one of the big problems especially with young people and especially in the education system, you know, cool it could be sometimes when you're targeted by certain sections, 
but they're frightened of this uh, issue and to be open about it and get support for it. And I think it's, it, for me, it's on a, a spectrum. And we've had this conversation before, I know, but that sense when people want to know what's wrong with them. You know, we're working with young people who are falling out of the system or not want to come to school. People say, what's wrong with them? Well, actually, there's lots of things happening round about them that are making... It's not just something that's going to be sorted in a medical way. There are other things that you can do um, to understand why young people might respond in a particular way, which is also um, a bigger conversation about some of the, the, the experiences young people have, and perhaps that issue around equalities is reflected in that one as well. Is there anything else people want to highlight from the submissions or any issues they want to... Uh, point, uh, convener. Uh, it was suggested that Education Scotland become involved in sort of developing the personal and social education um, part of, of learning and, went, and looking at the, the appropriate stage um, to give PSE. Um, I, I would have said it probably starts before um, secondary school, probably starts in a, a primary setting. Um, Primaries get it better, so that thing about circle time and so on in primaries, quite often that's actually what they do. They don't call it, you know, um, this mental health, address mental health, it's simply about a wee class community talking to each other about the things, how they feel about stuff and how you should treat each other with respect. I'm not, I mean, I know we, there was an inquiry um, and of course there was a debate on personal social education, which I think highlighted the importance of good mental health as being part of that. Um, and that, to me, feels again, you know, Education Scotland may have a role in it, but I'm not sure if it's about modules. It's more about creating a space in a school for those conversations to take place and at that age appropriate. On, on that theme, and you know, I, I think Angus Robertson touched. Do you know what's your name again? <laughs> Angus McDonald. <laughs> uh, highlighted. <laughs> yeah, answers to anything. Um, <laughs> I'm quite offended myself. Um, the uh, maybe I need some help. Um, I mean, I've got I've got a, a, a ten year old, and I'm really struck by. And, and I also have a 33-year-old, <laughs> and I'm struck by... That's not funny. Uh, um, it's unusual. Uh, <laughs> and a 24-year-old. Um, so I am in a, a fairly unique position, <laughs> decades apart. <laughs> um, I'm very struck by the impact of social media and, and the way that the... the in the in the, the sort of school environment where there's maybe a bit of conflict within the school environment, its ability to spill into the rest of it. you can't get you can't don't get away from it you know it spills into to the rest of it and and you know I, I, as a parent i find it quite difficult to to uh, to manage that that process when that when that happens when when uh, you know the, the kids all gang up with each other and all that, that kind of thing and as you say i think primary schools where we have to 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 uh, to, to tackle to tackle that is think it's the best place to tackle that i think that, that kind of early intervention so uh, you know, I, I would I would agree with what's been said here around um, uh, the, the need for from earlier than, than secondary, secondary school education because for me it's coming out it's coming out very much in, in a primary setting. Okay. Anything else? Look at the um, how how public health campaigns can be a part of this, and uh, I have a mixed view as well about some of the technology comments that have been made, I do agree that there is a definite uh, influence from social media. However, some of the um, evidence uh, has also said that actually apps would be helpful to um, take forward that, that the contacts that you can get for the services. And if that's what young people want, uh, you know, that we should be looking at technology in a positive way as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think that's quite a lot for you to be getting on with in terms of taking it forward. I think all it does is it does highlight that just by the responses we've got, and we've said it already, but I want to put in record our thanks to everyone who's responded in whatever way they have done to this, because I think it's been immensely helpful, but indicates just how important an issue it is. But I think in taking it forward, um, 
the risk of repeating myself, we want to continue to be focused on that question of a, a, a young person feeling the need for help. How do they get help safely um, and get the support that they need? And how do people round about them? How do we round about our own young people? Are we, how are we aware? Um, or the people that we become across of what we can do to help too. So there's that kind of practical focus, but looking at the broader recommendations, I think that Brian's looking at. So unless there's anything else, I think that's been a, um, a useful discussion on something which, I, um, as Brian said already, um, and a petition and an experience from Annette McKenzie that has, you know, has been very powerful. And we would hope that what would come out of that would be recommendations, recognition that young people have identified the challenges in, in where they go to get help and help that they need when they most need it. Okay. Um, I think with that, we have um, concluded our business. I want to, as I've said, thank everyone who's contributed to this, and there is a very significant piece of work to continue to be done on a very important petition. With that, can I close the meeting and thank you for your attendance?